My name is Leila Nezi, um, and I'm teaching at Sabancı University, uh, which is a private university in Istanbul. Um, and um, I'm an anthropologist and an oral historian. And um, I want to uh, thank Jane very much uh, for this invitation, um, for her confidence in me, uh, because I'm not somebody who studies petitions. Um, I was uh, personally hit by a petition. <laughs> which you signed. <laughs> which I signed, uh, not expecting the results, uh, three years ago. Um, and this whole past year, I have been in court. Um, so it has been a very personal experience for me. And most recently, um, unexpectedly, um, I received a, a 25 month um, prison sentence, um, which is uh, now gone to appeal. So I was actually feeling very lucky to be able to um, even you know, get a visa to come here um, and to be here. Um, so in that sense, um, I found it very hard to uh, prepare a formal paper, uh, as you might imagine. Um, and I also didn't think I would write a paper on petitions. But after listening to everybody today, I have been so inspired. And I am learning so much that I think I will, at some point, I hope, have a paper. Um, so I start with that, and that's why I call my presentation um, an autoethnography, because it starts with my own story. Um, and to say a few things about um, what I found <coughs> very important today, um, in, in listening to you today, vis-a-vis -vis, um, what's happening in Turkey, were some of the things, especially that Aki said, um, and also Jane. So Akis talked about, um, you know, rather than defining petition, uh, to talk about petitioning. Um, so I found that very important, uh, because at least uh, for us now, um, those who are living the Academics for Peace petition, uh, it's really uh, something that is happening right now. It's a living thing. It's something we're experiencing. It's not uh, past. It's in process. And the petitioning thing, um, you know, has um, like a life uh, that's going on, you know, beyond the text, in the courtroom, uh, between people, within families, uh, in the transnational contexts. So yes, petitioning, I think that's really a very nice, useful word. And the other two words that Akis used, I found very useful, is the generative. Um, yes, uh, all the things that are being generated uh, from this text which uh, you know, we never expected. So we have to think about what is in the process of being generated, including I mean, our presence here, mm -hmm. uh, which is you know, uh, one of those generative things. I mean, it's like a, a bacteria or something that grows, right? <laughs> uh, and like process also. Uh, it's also a process, yes. Um, there is no really, there's no period, um, right? So the process, it goes on, and you reflect on history, and you look towards, um, you know, a new, um, uh, yeah, and it, we were talking with Isin just a moment ago, and she said, uh, we feel very differently now about signing petitions, for example, right? So, I mean, <laughs> uh, process. Um, and I think also the, um, both Akis and Jane made reference to language, of course. Um, so significant, this issue of language. Um, not only uh, the form and the content of the language, the text, uh, but for us, uh, the language we are experiencing in court. Um, and the whole issue of uh, whether language, what it means that language is uh, cultivated or vulgar, I love that because it's relevant in our case, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so, um, and I want to also say um, that it's wonderful to be in this panel with Nil Mutler, 
um, because she has gone further than me um, in writing about her, her own experience and about the larger frame uh, and publishing and you know, making it part of her academic research, uh, which you know, I haven't. Um, so, and also I think um, our presentations will hopefully complement one another because I have continued to live in Turkey. Um, and so I'm living uh, the Academics for Peace peti petition in Turkey while she is living it now in what we have now called the new diaspora. So we will hopefully have both perspectives, although I may end up in the diaspora, or I will um, at least temporarily end up because I'm leaving too, unfortunately. Um, so um, I really look forward to um, um, her perspective, and I hope we'll disagree <laughs> also. <laughs> uh, because you know, I really think that there are right now there are as many perspectives on the Academics for Peace petition as there are signatories. And that's another thing, uh, I think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so um, I want to begin with some recollections. Uh, so in January 2016, uh, like many academics in Turkey, um, I received an online petition, and we haven't yet talked about online petitions. And I think you know the fact that this was an online petition really um, you know has very significant uh, consequences. This online petition was titled in Turkish, um, "We will not be party to this crime." Uh, and also, you know, uh, even though we call it the Academics for Peace petition uh, in English, in Turkish it's not called a pet petition. It's called um, a bildiri. And, I, and so I want to also ask this question, because many people raise this issue. What is a petition? Which words are used? In what language? Um, you know, Akis talked about the traditional word for petition you know, in the Ottoman Empire, you know, arzuhal, uh, or even dilekçe. But we use the word bildiri, which is a different word, and it's a statement. Uh, so I, th I also want to raise this issue. What was a petition historically in Turkey? And is this a petition in that vein? Um, and I'm not so sure about that. So that's something I think we want to discuss. The other interesting thing about language um, is that at first I didn't understand that when I was in court, uh, the judge repeatedly asked me, whether I had read the petition in Turkish or English. And this was the last question I was expecting. So what's the point, right? Um, so he was very interested in trying to find out um, whether people who signed the petition were aware um, of the English version. So I mean, that's also very significant because of the issue of translation what is said in English, uh, or what is sayable in Turkish, and what is sayable in English. Later I realized what the, the whole fuss about language was about. And at that point I had no idea what was going on. I mean, why should I read it in English, obviously, right? We're in court in Turkey, you know. I mean, of course I read it in Turkish. Um, now, um, so I got this online petition. And as far as I can remember, and this was a long time ago, um, I had heard through the grapevine uh, that some people, and the then little known group who called themselves the Academics for Peace, so there was actually a group called the Academics for Peace before the petition, uh, but you know, they were not known, not widely known. And I had heard that there was you know, a text that was being written uh, to protest, of course, as many of you know, um, the restart of the dirty war uh, in Turkey's Kurdistan, and especially the killing of civilians in urban areas, um, such as Cizre and the Sur neighborhood in Diyarbakir and other places. Um, so I wasn't surprised when I got it. And I also think that um, 
I was one of the first signatories um, and one of the first full professors, um, you know, working in a Turkish university. Um, but at the same time, I think uh, it's important to note that because this was an online petition, uh, it wasn't clear who the authors were. And this was one of the big issues and remains one of the big issues, of course. Who wrote this text, right? <laughs> and uh, in the whole process, this was, of course, what the, you know, the government really wanted to know. Um, so the signatories were less important, actually, <laughs> than who wrote the text. Um, and I also admit uh, that when I signed the text, uh, when I signed the, the statement, the petition, whatever, um, that I really didn't read the text very carefully or think very much about it. And I don't think I was alone. So I think that's significant. So then what happened afterwards was not expected, I want to say. I think that many people who signed the petition, and many people signed the petition, over 2,000, which is, I think, quite a few uh, academics in Turkey and abroad, um, signed the petition. I think people, most people, did not expect what happened. And if, probably in hindsight, many people would not have signed if they had known how things would go. That's my view. Um, I also think that uh, even though there was a core group that wrote and circulated the petition, um, that, I mean, most, the people who signed, who ended up signing, um, I would say, you know, were made into something by having signed. Uh, but I still don't know if I would call that like a group, right? So I think that's something that's important. Um, I, I mean, you know, I, I wrote in my, um, uh, in my blurb, right? I said, you know, like Groucho Marx said, I don't want to belong to any club that will accept me as a member. You know, I've always felt that way. And that hasn't changed for me. Um, so I didn't sign as a member of a group. Um, but of course, having signed and having had the consequences, of course, we were made into something. And that's undeniable, whatever we want to call that. Mm. And um, I mean, Something, um, for example, in the sense that, um, I mean, in the court, uh, that something uh, was defined, um, you know, basically as um, uh, not belonging to a terrorist organization, but aiding and abetting a terrorist organization, which really means, uh, you know, uh, getting a prison sentence that uh, more or less, you know, a member of a terrorist organization which, you know, PKK is what they mean, of course. Uh, okay, so um, you are made uh, into a traitor, and so we have this banalization of the word terrorist, uh, you know, in Turkey today, right? So um, that's something very interesting, I think. Um, given, you know, the number and kind of people who signed this petition. Now, um, now th as I said, there are as many narratives as there are people who signed. And um, it's, it is possible also uh, to keep track of these narratives. Uh, and of course, as the signatories being academics, academics are trying to keep track. Um, and public intellectuals are trying to keep track by uh, recording uh, the court statements 
of academics. So it's also in English. Uh, so if you go into uh, BIANET, B-I-A net, uh, at the independent media organization, you can actually read uh, the individual statements of all the academics who have been forced uh, to give statements um, in court, right? So already, that's something very, very interesting. And we already have several books that have been published in Turkish uh, with uh, testimony. Um, of individuals, so you know uh, that in itself is is um, very very interesting. Mm. So um, okay, I think uh, Neil will talk more about this. But uh, so yeah, what was happening in Turkey? in early 2016 uh, when the petition was circulated. What was this all about? Um, so, um, so the, the war had started again um, and public intellectuals um, you know, felt very disappointed um, about the stalling of the peace process. Um, so the, I mean, so people really felt that, you know, uh, what we did, so we are scribblers, right? Uh, right? So being scribblers, we, um, we scribbled. Uh, but I really feel that people felt that this wouldn't mean anything at all. I mean, I really felt that, and I think many people felt that. This was one more online petition. I mean, you know, there was a war going over there, on over there. People were fighting with guns. I mean, who cares about scribblers, right? So really, uh, it, it was just going to go you know, down the uh, you know, black hole of cyberspace. That's what I think. I don't know, that's what I thought. And maybe that's why it was so easy to sign also. Um, but of course, that didn't happen. Um, and as you know, and it is, I think, somewhat uncanny two, that right after the petition became public, that President Erdogan you know, declared uh, academics, uh, critical academics and public intellectuals, traitors and terrorists. I mean, it, I, I just use the word uncanny because, I don't know, I mean, it's like, here's a list, you know? Just, you know, they're already there, right? I mean, you don't have to look for them. Um, so, I mean, that was very interesting, I have to say. Um, that, um, that's what really happened. Um, and so, in a way, I want to think about, um, you know, today, in hindsight, uh, we think about um, you know, the whole Erdogan or AKP regime as like one thing. But I, I really do think uh, we have to think about like the early AKP period and the later AKP period as very different. At least for those of us who lived it, really there was a difference. And in a sense, I would say, ironically, that it was the early AKP period that made the petition possible. I really think that. So it's very strange. All of it is very strange, right? Uh, it was possible to write it. It was possible to sign it. And yet, uh, everything changed afterwards, right? Um, uh, and what I mean by that is that, um, and again, I think Neil will talk more about this, but uh, all, the petition, of course, um, had a lot to do um, with the Kurdish issue in Turkey. And um, the change in conception, uh, or the beginning of a change in conception in the, Tur in, in the country. Uh, as in many <coughs> repressive societies, um, people in Turkey are very sensitized to context, where and to whom and how you talk about what, um, 
And in the 90s, when we had a very violent war in Turkey's Kurdistan, nobody would have written or signed such a petition. And as, a, as an academic who came back to Turkey in the early 90s, um, personally, I mean, I was very aware of the red lines of that society. Uh, if you worked um, in Turkey, um, in a university, you knew um, what the red lines were, and you know, you operated according to them. Um, at one point, I was writing for a newspaper, um, at, and I remember being told, you know, there are you know three subjects you don't write about: um, the Armenians, the Kurds, and the military. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so things changed dramatically uh, in the public sphere in the 2000s. And we have to admit that it happened in the early Erdogan period. And well, of course, it's a long story about you know why and how and so on. Um, but of course, it had to do um, with um, an attempt by the AKP government to gain power uh, and therefore to, uh, to get allies uh, from different groups. Um, and one of it to, was to get allies from um, the public intellectuals who were critiquing um, Turkey's uh, you know, republican regime, the Kemalist regime. So that was part of it. Uh, part of it was AKP's attempt uh, to weaken the military. Uh, part of it was the whole um, seeming attempt to try to join the European Union, right? So there are many things. And also the whole language um, of identity and diversity that the AKP used so successfully. Um, at that time. So the public sphere and the language changed, which I think you know, made it possible to talk about things that you know, could not be talked about. And we began to talk and write about things that maybe we talked and wrote about more in English, um, also in Turkish. Um, and so those were, among other things, the Armenian genocide, uh, the Kurds, and the military, um, among others. Um, I think it's also it's it's therefore very interesting to analyze uh, the form and content of the language of the petition. Five minutes? Oh my God. Sorry, sorry. Okay. I didn't think I had very much to say. <laughs> okay, okay. I, okay. Yeah, uh, okay, just very quickly. About the form and language of the petition. Um, the, one of the reasons I question uh, um, whether to call it a petition or not um, is because the language of the text is very harsh. It's very strong. Um, I mean, in the name, in the words of um, Jane, uh, it definitely uh, is uh, vulgar, right? And violent language, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> violent language. Um, and I think that's very interesting. And in a lot of the statements made by academics in court, uh, many of them referred to the text and said things like, "Well, if I wrote it, you know, I signed it." But if I wrote it, I'm not sure I would have put it this way, right? So I think this is something very interesting. This is the thing that I think uh, angered uh, the government the most, uh, the language. Um, yeah, because I mean, the, the, the text basically told the state uh, that it was wrong and what it should do. 
right? So I, I mean, I don't have time to go to the text, but even we will not be a party to this crime, right? So one of the things we were constantly um, asked in court was, you know, whose side are you on, right? So, um, but um, the one other point that, um, one, one point I also want to make um, has to do um, with the role of academics and public intellectuals <coughs> in Turkey. Uh, I think this petition raises a lot of issues about that. Um, you know, education is very valued in Turkey. Uh, people historically have always wanted to educate their children and make them into civil servants. Um, however, as you know, when people are educated, <laughs> uh, they can also critique. And the word aydın, which means uh, in, enlightened uh, in Turkish, is also a boy's name. Uh, so let's not forget that um, in this, uh, you know, vulgarly worded um, uh, so-called text, it is the public intellectuals in Turkey who are speaking in the name of the Kurds, right? I think that's something that we want to talk about because many people brought up this issue. Whose voice it is? Who's doing the speaking? Who's doing the writing? Uh, that's very important. Uh, and I think this is something we need to think about. And because today, the Academics for Peace petition is talked about more in terms of the academics then in terms of the peace. What about the Kurds? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're all in jail, right? And things have gotten much worse for them, regardless of the petition. So I think you know, that's something very important for us. Um, what is the relationship between um, the Turkish left, uh, the Kurdish movement, public intellectuals, and uh, the petition. Oh, I went over? Two, two minutes. Two minutes. Um, oh, just maybe just to add one thing. Um, many people talked about the relations created by petitions. Um, and, and again, about what the petition does and where it goes. Um, and I think while I have my critiques you know, of the whole thing, I also uh, um, think that um, as many people in Turkey now um, you know, have become much more acquainted uh, with the police, the gendarmerie, the prison system, and the court system as never before, um, not only academics, but others. Um, in that sense, I think, uh, you know, the, the petition has been generative. Um, in the sense that it has affected uh, family and kinship networks in a very strong way. And just to give a very tiny example from my experience is that my own family, uh, you know, who, you know, felt, um, you know, very worried about, you know, my choices um, of research, uh, et cetera, you know, um, themselves found themselves going to court, um, you know, because when you have a family member who might go to prison, you know, things change for the, for the kinship network. And I think in this kind of way, indirectly, uh, this petition is having uh, very generative effects, uh, which we have to still see. Uh, but that, that part, I think, you know, we haven't talked a lot about, which I think is um, you know, very important for the society and the society's relationship uh, with the state. <coughs> Thank you.